Can you remember the uh, last talk I gave? It's actually quite a long time ago, I suppose. It must have been in the beginning of March. But I was talking about how the ideas about the Buddha changed from like the early scriptural tradition and then developing through the later scriptural tradition into the period before the commentaries and then in the commentaries and so on. Now I wanted, I wanted to go over that same ground again, but looking at it in a different way, which is looking at the representations of the Buddha. It's really in the Indian tradition. That means the sculptural tradition and the uh, scriptural tradition in India as it developed over the years. So the first section is just to look at how the Buddha is represented in the scriptural tradition. So the first few of these slides, okay, there's just some reading comes with them. Afterwards we look at the, you know, the statues and things of the Buddha. But in the first one, this comes from Chulago Singha Sutta. And this illustrates perfectly how the Buddha was very indistinguishable from any other recluse. Thus I have heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Nardika in the brick house. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Nandia and the Venerable Kimbala were living at the park of the Gosingasala tree wood. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the park of the Gosingasala tree wood. The park keeper saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and told him, Do not enter this park, recluse. There are three clansmen here seeking their own good. Do not disturb them. Then the Venerable Anuruddha heard the park keeper speaking to the Blessed One and told him, Friend park keeper, do not keep the Blessed One out. It is our teacher, the Blessed One, who has come. What you can understand from that is the park keeper couldn't recognize the Buddha. He can recognize that he's a recluse, but he cannot distinguish him from any other recluse. He looks the same as anybody else, basically. If we just think forward, when we look at the representations of the Buddha, he's got very special hair, he's got like this special kind of thing between his eyes, the very many things are different about the Buddha in the later representations, like the statues and things. If he looked like that, he would be distinguishable. If he had these curly hairs and the big protuberance on his head, he wouldn't be looking like any other recluse. And he would be very distinguishable. People would know, oh, it's the Buddha has come, you know. We should let him in. We should bring him into the park so that he can meet his disciples. But the park keeper doesn't know who he is. So this is the Chulago Singha Sutta from the Majjhima Nikaya. If, if we go on to the next one, this is Samanyapala Sutta from the Diga Nikaya. Also this very famous sutta when King Ajatasattu decided to go to the Buddha and ask him some questions, you see. And that's what turned into being Samanyapala. It means the fruits of the recluse life. Ajatasattu goes in the evening to the park where he's staying. So it says, King Ajatasattu, having ridden on his elephant as far as the ground would permit, a lit and continued on foot to the door of the round pavilion. Okay, we'll actually see a representation of this later. It comes in one of the slides that I'm going to show you later. Then he said, Jivaka, where is the Lord? It means where is the Buddha, you know. Again you see Ajatasattu looking in at all the monks. He cannot distinguish which is the Buddha, right? The Buddha is not looking different from anybody else. And... Um, Jivaka. Jivaka means uh, Jivaka Komara Bacha. That's the Buddha's physician. He became the Sangha's physician. He was the one who volunteered to look after all the medical needs for the Buddha and for the Sangha. 
So Jivika said, that is the Lord, sire. That is the Lord sitting against the middle column with the order of monks in front of him. So he has to actually specifically point him out to the king, which one is the Buddha. Because sitting in a group of monks, he can't distinguish him. You know, he doesn't have these distinguishing marks that he gains later in the way that people think about him later. It's not even so much later, actually. But these are the, these are early suttas, you see, early things. But there's a the, the most impressive of these is this one. It's from uh, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta. Thus I have heard, on one occasion the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the pot of Bhagava and said to him, If it is not inconvenient to you, Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, Venerable Sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, Venerable Sir. Now, first of all, he's just addressing him as Venerable Sir. He doesn't know that it's the Buddha. When, when he goes to meet Bhagava, he, doesn't, he can't distinguish that this is the Buddha apart from anybody else. Now there was a clansman named Pukasati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion he was already staying in the potter's workshop. Then the Blessed One went to the Venerable Pukasati and said to him, If it's not inconvenient to you, Bhikkhu, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the Venerable One stay as long as he likes. Now this is somebody who is ordained as a bhikkhu in the Sangha, but he's never met the Buddha. When he does meet the Buddha, he cannot distinguish him. He cannot recognize him. There's nothing that he knows about the Buddha that distinguishes him from anybody else. So it's not like a, you know, just a casual thing on a dark night and you look and you can't make out which is the Buddha. What it shows, I think, really quite conclusively is that the Buddha just looked like any other recluse. You know, he must have had his head shaven, been wearing some sort of robe. Uh, so the Buddha just looks like an ascetic. He just looks like any other ascetic that there is. So this is another of, the, of these, right? This is from Vasala Sutta. Then the Blessed One, going on an uninterrupted begging round in Sarvati, came to the house of the Brahmin Agika Bharadwaja. The Brahmin Agika Bharadwaja saw the Blessed One coming from afar off and said this to him, Stop there, shaveling! Stop there, wretched ascetic! Stop there, outcast! This Mundaka, a Munda, is somebody who has his head shaved specifically. So we know from this and other references, similar references, that the Buddha must have been shaven-headed. This Brahmin is reproaching him for being shaven-headed. In fact, Munda, it, it means a sh somebody who shaves their head. Mundaka, it mean, it's like derogatory. He's speaking very down to him. This cart uh, at the end, it actually reduces the status of the person. It says Mundaka, and then it says not Samana. A Samana is a respectable ascetic. But he says Samana Ka. It means little ascetic or wretched ascetic. You know, somebody who's, you know, is putting him down again like that. And then he calls him a Vasala. A Vasala is an outcast. It means he's not within the Brahminical idea of what forms society. In fact, it's true, in fact. Uh, he's not within that. As, as a monk, he's stepped out of the caste system. But he's saying it, of course, the Brahmin is saying it as an aggressive thing. But the thing is that he calls him a mandaka, you see. He's shaved. Sundarika uh, Sutta, same thing. The Brahmin Sundarika Bharadwaja saw the Blessed One sitting at the foot of a tree with his head covered. Right. So at this point, he, he doesn't know who he is. He's just sitting there with like his robe over his head or whatever like that.
Having seen him, he took the sacrificial cake in his left hand and the water pot in his right hand and approached the Blessed One. The background is he's just performed a sacrifice and now he's looking for somebody worthy to give the cake to. Because if he gives the cake to somebody worthy, it's more merit. Okay? When the Blessed One heard the sound of the Brahmin's footsteps, he uncovered his head. Then the Brahmin Sundar uh, Bharadwaja thinking, this worthy is shaven-headed, this worthy is a shaveling. He actually calls him a munda and then a mundaka. And he wanted to turn back. Uh, but it occurred to him, some Brahmins also shave their heads. So let me approach and inquire about his birth. Because if he's a Brahmin, he would be a worthy recipient for the offering. If he's really a mundaka, like an ascetic who's renounced caste and everything like that, then he wouldn't be considered worthy. Of course, the Buddha teaches him, you know, and then, you know, he converts and everything. He understands that the Buddha is a great teacher and, he, he, you know, like that. Then he wants to give his cake, but the Buddha won't take it. Again, we can see that the Buddha is shaven-headed, yeah. Okay, in the later part of the canon, we get a couple of suttas where they talk about the 32 marks of the great man. We've all heard about the 32 marks of the great man. They are canonical. These come in the canon. In fact, there's 32 marks of a great man and there's 80 marks, 80 minor marks. But those 80 minor marks do not come in the canon. They come later. They're known to other traditions as well. They're known in the Mahayana, for instance, and in other Hinayana traditions as well. Uh, they're known in the Theravada too. But in the canonical times, we don't get the 80 marks. We only get these 32 marks. Some of them are a bit kind of, um, in a way, they're a bit odd. Okay, like number nine. When he stands without stooping, the palms of both his hands touch and rub against his knees. If you, if you look at a normal human being, it means his f arms would be like, you know, extraordinarily long. So it, he would look extraordinary if he had arms that are basically about 50% longer than our arms, you know. Right, on the soles of his feet, there are wheels uh, with a thousand spokes and ribs. So y you know when you look at the the Siripada, that means the Buddha's feet, when he's in Parinibbana or whatever, he always has these wheels on it. We'll see some examples in a minute. Another one, it, here it says, he has netted hands and feet. What it means is, between his fingers, there's netting. It's webbed, webbed fingers and webbed toes. It's a very odd kind of thing. His male organ is enclosed in a sheaf, like a horse's, is what it says in the commentary. He's very fine-skinned, and because of the fineness of his skin, dust and dirt do not stick on his body. They contrast it, actually, with a lizard. You know, when you, look, when you, you see a lizard has very, very rough skin, it's always covered in dirt. So the Buddha was extremely fine-skinned, and then the dust, you know, would find nowhere to stick it just kind of drop off he's the color of gold and his skin has a golden sheen all the the old statues of the buddha they would have been painted you know and they would have been painted golden these are all about the kind of firmness and uh, strength of his body you know he has straight limbs like a brahma he has Seven convexities, I can't explain it to you. He has the torso of a lion, that means a very strong torso. A furrow between his shoulders is filled in. He's got the spread of a banyan tree, the span of his arms equals the height of his body. That's normal actually. I don't know if you know, but the span of your arms is normally the same as the height of your uh, body. So that's not abnormal in fact. This is a strange one, you see. Because the others are physical characteristics that you can kind of see. If you had access to it, you, could, you would be able to see it. But this one is, his taste is supremely acute. 
So you couldn't see that, you know, no matter where you looked, you know, only he would know that one. There's no way for anybody else to know it. He's got a lion's jaw, a strong jaw. And this is a strange one. He's got 40 teeth. And his teeth are very even. But we never see the Buddha with his mouth open in any of these representations. So we can't count his teeth. His teeth are without caps. He has a large tongue. This is a very strange one because when they're uh, try investigating the Buddha to see if he's got all these marks, uh, there's a couple they, got, they can't find out. They can't find out about his male organ, so he shows his male organ to them. And they can't find out about his tongue. So he puts his tongue out and he licks his forehead. And then he licks his ears from side to side to show how big his tongue is because this is one of the signs of a great man. Uh, he's got a divine voice. His eyes are deep blue. And he has the eyelashes of an ox. That means supremely long eyelashes like that. Right? And his head is shaped like a turban. What it means is this protuberance, his wisdom bump. It's sometimes called his wisdom bump on his head. The ones I've marked in yellow are actually the ones that we can see on the later representations of the Buddha in the statues and things like that. So this actually comes twice in the early text. It comes in Majjhima Nikaya and it comes in Diga Nikaya. In Majjhima Nikaya, what they do is they tell these marks and then they tell other things about the Buddha, about how he comports himself. That means how he walks, how he sits, how he takes the dana, how he cleans his bowl, all like this. What they're doing in a way is describing a perfect monastic. He doesn't tip his bowl too far forward. He doesn't tip it too far back so that dikers have difficulty putting things in. Yeah, It's perfectly level. When he washes it, it's right. When he takes his food, you know, nothing drops or anything like this, you know. And when he swallows his food, all of it goes at one go. And it's all always perfectly chewed. They're kind of describing like a perfect monastic, you know. His comportment, following on these marks, the way he bears himself around. When he walks, he looks with his eyes down, a plow's length in front. He doesn't look around. It's an ideal for a monk, you see. So that's in the Majjhima Nikaya. But the Diga Nikaya is very interesting because it gives all these marks and then it tells what he did in his past lives to get these marks. These are karmic results of deeds that he's done in his past life. You see, even by this time in the late scriptural tradition, then the Buddha, you know, his physique is very, very different to, you know, what it is in the early suttas, you know. You've kind of got a different kind of idea about, you know, the Buddha stands out. He's very different from everybody else. So this is actually the um, main Buddha statue on the Vajrasana. The Vajrasana means the diamond throne. It means the th place where the Buddha sat when he attained awakening, which is underneath the Bodhi tree. This is inside the temple. Behind the temple, the Vajrasana sticks out and then the Bodhi tree is there. This is the front part of the Vajrasana. This is at the back of the temple. This actually continues over here and goes into the temple itself and that's where the statue is sat. This is the back of it and this is the Bodhi tree. It's not though the Bodhi tree that the Buddha sat under, you know. The Bodhi tree that the Buddha sat under was destroyed. They first of all took a sapling from the original Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka and planted it. That tree is still still surviving in Sri Lanka. When the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya was cut down by one of the Hindu kings, later they went to Sri Lanka and they got a sapling from the daughter tree and they brought it back and they planted it. But that tree also died. And then they went in the 19th century, they went to Sri Lanka again and they uh, took another sapling and they planted it. The tree that we see now at Bodhgaya is actually about 
150 or 160 years old, something of that nature. It's not so old. So you can see he has golden skin. His hair is all in these curls. He has this growth of hair between the eyebrows. Many people, you know, think this is the third eye. But this is not the third eye. It's not an eye at all. What it is is a growth of white hair is what it's supposed to be between his eyebrows, which is white with the sheen of soft cotton. That's one of the marks of a, of a Buddha. And he's got the protuberance. We always notice that the Buddha has these long ears. The reason for that is because he was a prince. And the prince would put heavy jewellery in their ears. And in actual fact, it stretches the ear. If you've ever seen, mainly nowadays you see it on tribal peoples. You know, you can see in the uh, mountain tribes in um, uh, Myanmar or in Thailand. Also, you can see amongst tribal peoples in India. They often wear very heavy jewellery. And then their ears become extremely elongated. Uh, so in those days, as a sign of their wealth and riches, the kings and the princes and so on would wear these heavy jewels. So the Buddha's ears, I mean, he, you know, before he was a Buddha, of course, uh, when he was the Bodhisattva, uh, at that time his ears were stretched. Um, but it's one of the 80 marks. It's not one of the 32 marks. This is a mark, actually, that many people would have had you know, anybody who was rich enough to have jewellery would have had this mark. So this is a, you know, a siripada, like a blessed foot if you like. It means the Buddha's foot with the wheel on it. In fact, they start putting on all sorts of auspicious marks. And then the wheel, it isn't thousand mark. you can't see a thousand marks. But anyway, you can tell, you know, this is the bottom print. His foot is very flat as well. That's one of the marks, if you remember. One thing I wanted to say, actually, is this. You know, it's not only the Buddha's uh, footprints that we find. The idea of worshipping the footprints is common in, in India. Uh, so you find for Mahaviras, one of the most common sign for Mahavira, who is the founder of the Jaina sect, uh, one of the most common signs that you'll see in the, their Jaina temples is actually the footprints. But I didn't see anyone, any of them with this, you know, with this circle on it or anything like that. But not only Jainas, also Hindus as well. So this is Vishnu's foot I saw in one Hindu temple. But the, the idea is... The Indian tradition, when you go to a guru, the first thing you do is take the dust of his feet. You, you, you bow down and you touch his feet and you put the dust of his feet to your brow as a sign of respect. So this idea of the holy feet of the guru is common throughout the kind of Indian tradition. So also it comes, you see, in Buddhism. With the Buddha's feet, they, go, they have all these special marks, auspicious marks. If you've ever been to Wat Po in Thailand, to that very famous uh, Parinibbana statue, and you see on the bottom, you have extremely elaborate uh, representations. I think there's something like 108 auspicious signs on the soles of his feet, done in mother of pearl. It's very, very wonderful. Okay? So here we get the same idea, but it's on his hand. It doesn't mention it in the early thing. They started representing the wheel on his hand, again as this kind of special sign that this is the Buddha that we're looking at, and he's somehow very special. You can see it, there's two, actually. There's one here. Right, now then. We come to when we first start getting physical representations of the Buddha. Earlier we were talking about the scriptural tradition and giving some examples how that, how that was shown. You know, the first representations of the Buddha, very, very surprisingly, don't show the Buddha at all. It's very unexpected, really. They will show 
the Bodhisattva. That means there's many Jataka stories and the Bodhisattva is shown. But in the very early period, when we get the stupas at Sanchi and the stupas at Bahut, they don't show the Buddha. After the Mauryans, that means Ashoka's dynasty, had fallen, which was not long after Ashoka died. I think his grandson was overthrown by the Sunghas. 185 BC. You know, if you, if you can remember what I've told you about before, Ashoka's empire was really quite big. It had contracted and contracted after Ashoka because his son and his grandson were not at the same standard. They were not able to maintain that empire. And the empire had shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And because of that, they were overthrown and the Sangha dynasty took over. And at the same time, in the south part of the old Mauryan Empire, a new empire arose, which was the Satawahana Empire. And it was the Satawahana craftsmen who were responsible for the railings and therefore the relief sculptures, both for Bahut and Sanchi and for Amarawati, uh, which had a similar style near their capital in what is now Andhra Pradesh, and also for the first excavations at Ajanta and at Ellora. Now it's during Ashoka's time that Sanchi was first built, but we can't see anything from Ashoka's time now because it was built over again later. Actual fact, they kept building, you know. They keep building and building and building in these places. They don't do it and finish and go home, you know, and that's the end of it. You know, Ashoka built a stupa. When they've got more means, they built a better stupa. When they got more means, they put all sorts of decorations around the stupa. When they got more means, they build the stupa up higher. So we can't think of these monuments as static. They're not built and finished. That doesn't happen. They're built and they're improved and they're improved and they're improved again. The one we're going to be looking at is Bahut. So here we see a representation on the Bahut stupa. And what you've got, this is the Vajrasana, which is where the Buddhists sat. And this is the Bodhi tree. These are the devas around the Bodhi tree. And then there's two people. We don't know who they are in this case. Occasionally we do know. But in this case we don't know who they are. But there's two people worshipping the Vajrasana. But what they're doing, they're not worshipping the Vajrasana. They're worshipping the Buddha. This is standing in place of the Buddha. As you all know, of course, uh, this being a Muslim country, you cannot represent Muhammad out of reverence. If you give a physical form to somebody, you kind of limit what they look like, who they are, what they can do. You know, what if, you, what if it's not so good? Or what if it doesn't meet your ideal or something like that, you know? So maybe, we don't actually know uh, the reason, of course, because they don't tell. There's no way to ask them either. Uh, but maybe that was the reason for this as well. You know, maybe it was thought that the Buddha simply cannot be represented. There's no way to do it justice or something like this, you know. There's no way to portray him in a way that would be satisfactory. So instead they use symbols. So one of the main symbols they use is actually the seat of the uh, where the Buddha attained enlightenment and the tree under which he attained enlightenment. So here's a, another one. But here we have a very interesting situation because this is the Vajrasana. In fact, in this case, because there are inscriptions, we know that this is a Jatasattu. And here we see the feet. He's worshipping the feet of the Buddha, 
But again, they don't show the Buddha, they just show these Siripada. And you've got this interesting thing here as well with these hands on the Vajrasana. I don't know what they represent. And two birds are there as well. When they've given the inscriptions, most of these got inscriptions with them so we can recognize uh, people, we can recognize some of the characters or uh, the story. Sometimes it says it's this Jataka or it's that Jataka or whatever it is so we can positively identify what is going on. But they don't explain everything. You know, these are short inscriptions. It runs down here. This is telling what that is. It's written in Prakrit. So that describes this scene that we're seeing. So it's very, very fortunate, of course, that they gave these inscriptions and we know what they're trying to represent and everything, you know. Otherwise, anyway, we would be more left to guesswork. It would be more difficult to uh, work out what was going on and you would have conflicting ideas. One person would say it's this and another person would say it's that and there'd be ideas on both sides. Okay, again, we have somebody worshipping the Vajrasana with the Bodhi tree. And here we have Muchilinda. So, you know, you know, after the Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, he went to the Muchilinda tree. Yeah? And then this cobra came. You've seen the representations. This cobra came kind of a cobra or a naga or what or a dragon or however you want to visualize it and then he wrapped himself round the buddha and then he put his coils over the top so when you see these representations that's sometimes shortly after the awakening so that must be what this is representing but again we don't see the buddha you see we just see muchilinda and we have to know that the buddha is there but they don't represent him. I guess, actually, that this is like the king and his wives or something, you know. Another way that the Buddha is represented is just with the wheel. It's like the Dhamma Chakra, you know. You've got two people paying respects. Uh, probably a king again down here. And he's coming, you see. And then he gets down and he walks up and then he comes round and he pays respects. Uh, but it's represented here just by the wheel. But that's signifying the Buddha. This is a very nice one indeed. I like this uh, so much. You know, according to tradition, in the seventh rains retreat, the Buddha went to heaven and taught his mother the Abhidhamma. At the end of the rains retreat, he descended from Tarvatimsa heaven and he came down at Sankasa. You can go to Sankasa. It is one of the sites on the pilgrimage route in India. A bit out of the way, actually. So this is like the stairway coming down from heaven. Again, we see the Vajrasana and we see the Bodhi tree. Vajrasana is the throne where the Buddha was sitting when he attained enlightenment. You remember, when he went to the Bodhi tree, Satya gave him some grass, and he put that grass down, and he sat down. That's the throne that he sat on. Later it becomes kind of idealized as this kind of thing like this. But, you see, th this is how we can know. This is actually Sankasa. This is not Bodhgaya, but the Vajrasana is there. Why is the Vajrasana there? It's because it's not Vajrasana, it's signifying the Buddha. You see, it's a symbol of the Buddha. This, actually, fact, is in Bodhgaya, which is hundreds of kilometers away. Here also, if you look here, we see the Buddha's foot. And here again, we see the Buddha's foot. At the top, in heaven, and then later, back down on earth. They're representing the Buddha, but they don't show him. It's what we call the, the aniconic period in Buddhist art. So the original 
the original idea was that we don't show the Buddha. He's too beyond representation. This is this um, one of Ajata Sattu. There's three scenes in this picture. Okay, here Ajata Sattu and his wives, they're all on elephants themselves. This is Ajata Sattu. He's on his elephant and he's got his wives with him and he's coming. Here the elephant has got down so that Ajata Sattu, now here, can get off. And then he walks the rest of the way with his wives until he comes and he worships the Buddha, which is represented w once again by the Vajrasana. They don't show the Buddha. He's worshipping somebody, but they won't show it. But that's an illustration of this discourse I was talking about earlier, where Ajata Sattu comes, if initially he can't recognize the Buddha, and then eventually he's shown where he is, he goes and worships him. This is also interesting, because this is actually the Bodhi tree, not now of Sakya Muni Buddha, but of Vipassi Buddha. So the leaves are different, you see. It's actually a Patali tree. Yeah, the Buddha sat under a people tree. That's you know this tree that you see at Bodh Gaya, right? All the Buddhas, I think I've told you before, all the Buddhas have a Bodhi tree, but the Bodhi tree is different for each Buddha. It's not the same tree for each Buddha. Our Sakyamuni Buddha sat under a people tree, but every other Buddha sat under a different tree. So Vipassi Buddha sat under a Patali tree. Again, you've got people worshipping. They're presenting a garland, but we don't see Vipassi. Yeah. Buddhas are kind of too special to represent. Instead, we use symbols. So in the early period, this is how it is. Where we look at the uh, representations in Sanchi or in Bahut, which are the earliest uh, representations we have, we don't show the Buddha at all. We use symbols to represent him. I just included this because I read somewhere uh, that another symbol of the Buddha was the stupa. I'm not myself convinced of it. It may be so, but it could also be that they're just worshipping a stupa. Maybe there's something in a you know in an inscription that gives it away that it means the Buddha himself, and not just the bodily remains. That this is maybe there's some way that we know that this is a symbol. Sometimes they say that the uh, stupa simply represents him. Of course, it does. You know, when we go to a stupa, that brings back to our mind the physical presence of the Buddha because all stupas should have Buddha relics in them. You know, that means like a small memento of the Buddha's actual body should be in a stupa. In a way, you see, we still get that symbology. When we go to a stupa, we do worship it like it's somehow incarnating the Buddha for us, somehow making the Buddha present. I'll just say something about that because there's a very interesting thing if you think about it. When the Buddha passed away, there's a big problem for the sasana. Clearly we still have the Sangha. They're present to you. Because the Sangha is present, the Dhamma is also present. But the Buddha when he's died, where is he? Can you see the problem? You know, the, now you've only got two jewels that are present. It's because of this that you get things like the, the stupa worship and everything. The stupa is making the Buddha present to you in the present day. If there's nothing there, if there's nothing, you've lost at one of the triple gem. It's no longer physically present to you. The stupas, the relics in the stupas, if you like, that makes the Buddha 
present to you physically in later times. It solved the problem, if you see what I mean. The Sangha and the Dhamma are present and you can come into contact with them. How do you come in contact with the Buddha? It's through the presence of the relics and the power that they kind of embody. Now, early representations of the Buddha. The Gandhara period, the main center for Gandhara is now where we would say the Swat Valley in Pakistan and the Kabul Valley in Afghanistan. That in olden times was known as Gandhara. That was the main center for Gandhara. At its greatest extent, it came all the way down into these areas. But its real center is just here. It's just in this area. Now this is also important. You know, the Greeks under Alexander, just before Ashoka's time, they crossed over Iran and they invaded into India. In fact, they only got so far because the Indian forces of Chandragupta were so strong, the Greeks wouldn't continue any further. They, they refused to cross the river because they said, if we cross the river, we'll be slaughtered. They simply don't have the strength to throw over the Mauryan Empire, which was in its heyday at the time, you know. So they settled in these areas, what is now Pakistan and Afghanistan and parts of Iran, is where the Greek forces settled. And they had these Indo-Greek kingdoms. You know, they must have intermarried and everything like this, you know. The indigenous population would be there, which would have been Indian. And the Greek population was there. So that you got this kind of meeting of civilizations. That means the Indian civilizations and the Greek civilization, which was also at its peak at that time. These uh, these places, Jamogai, Lorian, Tangai, uh, Shaderi and Hadar and Taxila, that's actually where we find the most prominent remains of the Buddhist period were found in these areas. That's where we have all these Gandharan statues from and everything like this. It's all in these Swat Valley, uh, Kabul Valley area. Now when we look at the first representations of the Buddha, the most remarkable thing about it, if you ask me, is he's very European. The reason is, it's because it's found amongst the Greek populations and their models were the Greek statues of Apollo. These, this is a copy of an old Greek statue. And you see how the hair is like wavy. You see it from the side. It's done in these waves. This statue actually was rediscovered in the 15th century and it became the absolute perfect icon of uh, the Renaissance period in Europe. All representations of the perfect human form were based on this statue. Now w when we look at the hair, we look on the hair of the Buddha, it's obviously wavy, you know. He's got his protuberance. He's got his spot of hair between his eyebrows. But his features are very Greek. The reason is, the people who made the first representations of the Buddha were Greek. Heracles once said, if crocodiles could make sculptures of their gods, they would look like crocodiles. <laughs> you know, when you, you look at it yourselves, you, you know, when the Chinese made statues of the Buddha, he looks like a Chinese. When the Greek make statues of the Buddha, he looks like a Greek. <laughs> Non-representations, the aniconic period, were in the heartland of the Buddhist kingdoms, where they would have had, you know, the highest respect uh, for the Buddha, and would have probably not had the idea to represent him. 
when the first representations come, it's actually on the edge of the Buddhist kingdoms, where, you know, perhaps they have different ideas, you know. They've already represented their gods and so on and so forth like this. And then they want a representation of the Buddha, so, yeah, they do it. And it, he looks like a Greek. See, this is the Bodhisattva in the period of his austerities. But again, he's got the same hair, he's got the protuberance and everything. Also, another thing you can notice is that the halo is plain. He has a halo, but it's just plain done in stone. Uh, so this is also from Gandhara. This uh, statue is actually in um, the museum at Lahore. So this now is uh, Buddha in meditation posture. He has the hair, he has the uh, this uh, mark. See also here he has this plain kind of halo around him. And also you can notice the robes. You know how we normally wear the robe, it doesn't look like this at all. This actually looks more like a Greek toga. They would wear these robes like this, you see. Because it's on the edge of Buddhist civilization, either they don't know how to represent him, or the sculptors, the trained sculptors, have uh, they've been trained in doing it one way, and they cannot adjust or something like that. This is the uh, Pari Nibbana, same same thing, quite nice. Uh, you know, you've got all the people kind of, you know, these are the malas. You know, they called the malas out from the village to come and see, you know, and they're all kind of screaming and crying and upset and everything like that and throwing themselves on the floor, except for the arahat who's just sat there understanding, you know, all things are impermanent. Uh, that's maybe Ananda, I think. This could be Subhadda. If you remember, Subhadda went to the Buddha and then he asked for ordination and Ananda is saying don't bother the Buddha he's dying you know and the Buddha said let him come and he, he's the last person who ordained in the sasana under the Buddha himself okay later representations we see very many changes this is during the Gupta period which was also a really great period for Buddhist art one thing I should say, of course, is you may not realize it, but just really all the great art in the early period in civilization, you can say, really comes from India. All these fantastic murals that you get at Ajanta, at Ellora, these unbelievable statues that come from Mata and Sarnat and everything. Uh, the later uh, bronzes and things like this that come from Gaia and Nalanda, you know, you know, the Buddhist culture in those days was way out in front, you know, in terms of technical skill, in terms of um, provenance. That means, you know, where it's found. It found all over. Enormous numbers of uh, statues come from that period. Fantastic buildings. If you look at uh, somewhere like Ajanta, it's carved out of a mountain. You've got whole temples are carved out of the mountain. They're not built out of stone, you know, stones on top of stones. They're carved into the mountain itself, you know, and then they have the pillars and everything like that. The amount of work that has gone into this, you know, just shows how advanced the civilizations were. I think I've said before, but it, it's worth bearing in mind, you know, the earliest books that we have in the world are Buddhist books. The earliest printing presses were Buddhist printing presses. The earliest known book that we have a date on is a Buddhist book. The Buddhist civilization at its height in that period was the leading civilization in the world. No, nobody else was anywhere near it. Actually, the Roman and the Greek civilizations were fairly advanced and they did have some uh, things, but nothing like on the scale that uh, they had in Buddhist India. Nothing like it, you know. When Nalanda was founded, it was the world's biggest university. There were 10,000 students at Nalanda. 
Nalanda was founded in the 5th century. The first European universities were founded in the 13th century and they were nowhere near as big. Yeah. Oxford University was a very famous university. Up until the 20th century, it didn't have anything like 10,000 people. And there wasn't just Nalanda. I've only put Nalanda down, but there were plenty of universities around, all with these sort of numbers in them, over into Bangladesh. So many universities. And people, as you know, like Zanshan, walk from China in the most impossible environments he had to cross through you know terrible deserts and over you know impassable mountains and everything like that he walked from china to india why because india was the center of civilization where you could find all the scriptures and everything and then he packed all the scriptures onto the back of 22 mules and walked them back into china you know but not only uh, Zanshan, but people came from all over the civilized world to learn because at Nalanda, it was actually a liberal university, you know. They didn't just teach Buddhism. Yeah. They didn't just teach Dhamma. They also taught literature. They taught medicine. Uh, they taught history. They taught the Vedas. That's, if you like, a competing religious system. But they taught the Vedas, so it was very liberal there. They taught, of course, you know, Buddhist philosophy and logic and mathematics, science. All of these things were being taught at Nalanda, you know. It must have been at somewhere like Nalanda that Aryabhata was working. He was the mathematician who invented zero. Before that, we didn't have this idea of zero and placement. Sometimes it's been said that the, the invention of zero is the greatest human invention since fire. It made such a big difference because the, 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 once you've got the, the idea of zero, you've got the idea of placement where those zeros are, it makes the different numbers and everything like that. Mathematics becomes extremely easy and versatile. Science you know, really takes off once you've got the invention of zero. So zero was invented by Aryabhata. It would have been in one of these universities in India in the 6th century. So this is from Mathura, uh, which was one of the Italias of the Buddhist schools, one of the main schools for Buddhist sculpture came from here. And here we see, for the first time, this idea of the ringlets. Now he doesn't have this kind of um, wavy hair, but he has this idea of the ringlets like we see here as well. The idea is, you know, in the, in the later traditions, what happened was, is when the Buddha crossed over the river Anoma, uh, after he, you know, when he was the Bodhisattva, when he left on the Great Renunciation, he crossed over the river Anoma, and then with his sword, he cut off his hair. Then the idea is that that hair was thrown, and it was caught by Saka, Deva, and he put it in a chaitya in heaven. But the other idea is that at that time, the Buddha's hair turned into these ringlets and it never grew again. He never had to trim it or cut it or do anything with it. It permanently uh, stayed like this throughout his life. This is where this idea comes from. And so at this time, they use these ringlets are there. Also interesting because his eyes are open. But normally, the Buddha's eyes are very low cast. See, again, we see these curls. This is from Sarnat. Sarnat and Matara are quite close in style. This is, I, I just like this so much, so I put it on the cover. You see, later we get this idea of the Buddha wearing a crown. Now, up to now, we've never had the Buddha wearing a crown. But later, this is still during the Gupta period, this is 5th century in Sarnat. Sarnat is Isipatana where the Buddha gave his first teaching. Uh, so, th you know, by now they've crowned him. And, but it's, I think the face is just wonderful. Like, I don't, don't know, it just some, does something for me. But the whole proportions are absolutely perfect somehow. Right, now then, 
Just to conclude this, up until very recent times, you only see the Buddha in very, very specific poses. You don't see him doing anything in any way. Like if you take photographs of people, you'll see them in all sorts of different poses. But with the Buddha, you don't. He only has a handful of different postures. So the, the, these examples just come from the Pala period. The, the artistic periods are the Sangha period, the Satavahana period, the, the Gandhara period, the Gupta period and the Pala period. So these statues just come from the Pala period. So one of the postures is this posture where the Buddha is sitting cross-legged and his hand is touching the earth. It's actually called Bhumisvasa in uh, Sanskrit. Bhumisvasa mudra. It's touching the earth mudra. If you remember when Mara, when the Buddha was sat under the Bodhi tree, Mara came, he brought all his legions with him. That means his whole army came with him. And Mara said, look, I have all these people to bear witness to me uh, that I am worthy who can bear witness to you? But the Buddha is sat alone under the Bodhi tree. So who can he call to witness? He called earth itself to witness that he had fulfilled the perfections. This is what this is telling you, see. He's put his hand on the earth and he's saying the earth itself will bear witness that I am worthy to sit on this Vajrasana and attain awakening. It's really powerful, you see. It's really wonderful. You know, what this is, in fact, is elephant. You see, on the left, elephant. On the right, an elephant. In the middle, it's a lion. Because these creatures are symbols of strength. They're, they're, they're saying, you know, how strong the Buddha is. He's supported by elephants and by lions. These are actually, must be uh, yakshas like Bhuma Deva. Okay, so this is one of the main symbols. You see the Buddha sitting in meditation posture and then he's touching the earth. It's recalling the time that he overcome Mara and attained awakening. This is in Dharma Chakra uh, Mudra, which is specifically when he's teaching the five ascetics at Sarnat. He holds a very specific thing with his hands. You see also the wheel on his hands there again, you see. And he's got the ringlets and everything. And he's got this kind of um, very tight robe and all like this. But he sat in full lotus and then he's got his hands in a very specific posture. This posture is first teaching the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta. And here at the bottom you see the deer. The picture not so clear. But at the bottom there, there's two deer around the Dhammachakka. Why? Because it was given in the deer park at Isipatana. This is the halo behind him, you see. Quite a nice halo. And then stupas making him again you know, present to people. The Buddha statue, of course, itself is making the Buddha present. Anyway, this posture, where he sat in a half lotus, actually, and then with his hands cupped in each other, this is Dhyana Mudra, or the meditation posture. So that's another of the postures that you can look out for. You see how, how slender the robe is. The robe is so fine, you see through it. It's done like this. There was a period when the Buddha statues are done like this, where the robe is just very fine and clinging to the body. This is giving blessings. It's Varada Mudra. If you see the, the Buddha, this is not so common, but you often see the Buddha with his hand out like this. That's when he's giving blessings to people. And then he's on the lotus. This around him, it's the halo actually. It's meant to, it's like a symbolic representation of fire. You see. So he's got this big fire halo 
all around. Okay, so you have to distinguish between this one, which is giving blessings, and this one, which is giving fearlessness. When the Buddha gives this sign, and this left hand is down, and this right hand is up like this, it's a Baya Mudra. And the, the Buddha is, is basically g giving a sign that there's nothing to be afraid of. You don't have to fear. This also, I think, is a very nice one. I, somehow I like these crown Buddhas, you know. I don't know why, but there's something really meaningful about it. See also, his robe is extremely fine, like this. So fine you can see the whole contours of his body. So that's the other one to look for. Again, because these standing Buddhas are not so common, uh, you don't see them everywhere. But this is another kind of uh, representation that you might come across. When, when you see he's got his hand up like this, it's fearlessness. When it's down like that, it's giving blessings. When there's, you know, hand in hand, it's meditation. When it's touching the earth, it's calling the earth to witness. This is a nice one, so I included this because, you know, the Buddha had idi power. Uh, that means he was able to make transformations of his body. So one of the things that, uh, that uh, people with idi power can do is from one body they can extract many other bodies. They make more and more representations of themselves. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, you know, the Buddha producing many bodies. This is him himself, but all these are him as well. They're all existing simultaneously. You know, he's teaching Dhammachaka here. And here is meditating. Here is fearlessness. Here it's giving blessings. Okay, this is the last one. And this is the Buddha with a subject, an entirely different subject which we didn't uh, cover tonight, which is the Bodhisattvas and the development of the Bodhisattvas and the representations of the Bodhisattva. You can see in a way by the scale of these things that the Buddha now is small and in the back and the Bodhisattvas, this is Avalokiteshvara and this is Tara. Tara is like a tantric Bodhisattva. So Avalokiteshvara and Tara have become more prominent than the Buddha. And in a way you can say that in the Mahayana, especially in the later period, that is what has happened. The Buddha in a way has faded into the background and these salvation bodhisattvas have come to prominence and they're in the foreground. But that's a, a different story for a different time. Uh, but I just thought it kind of fits in well with you know the whole story of tr trying to tell you know how the Buddha is kind of been visualized over the ages. But everybody say sadhu. <laughs>